Church history number 300 or 104. I'm going to read from a book right now. This book was printed in 1872. I've referred to it many times. It's a, causing me allergies, uh, so it's a little difficult for me to do this. Some of these old books in the 17, 16, 17, 1800s are really, they've got dander in them or something. I don't know what it is. That bothers me. This book is printed. in 1872 it is a defense of pedo baptism and the form of a baptism sprinkling basically which there is no scriptural foundation for it at all I get this one out of the way and see if I can read this without my nose running all over This is a defense. They will not put anything in here in defense of baptism by immersion at all or baptism because of, of salvation or repentance. In issuing the third edition of classic baptism, I would avail myself of the opportunity to express my great obligation to those who kindly undertook to read the manuscript and advance sheets of the first edition, engaging uh, and encouraging the publication by their warm approval of the method and results of their discussion. The favorable judgment for, by scholars and singularly uh, common dictatory criticisms by the press are gratefully accepted as testimony to the truth and usefulness of the work. While they uh, greatly transcend any personal claim or expectation of the author. The approval of the volumes come from scholars and periodicals of all denominations except from those and that one whose views are called in question, Baptist. This is written against Baptist. An intelligent review of the work proceeding from this source, fairly, however, uh, trenchantly made, would, approve, would prove the advantageous to the cause of truth. Their truth is sprinkling for baptism, but baptism for salvation. Baptism as a vehicle of grace, which is not biblical. And any such review has been made has not fallen under my notice. With the approval of competent judges among Episcopalians, Methodists, Congregationalists, Reformed German, Reformed Lutheran, and Lutherans, and Presbyterians, and various branches without adverse criticism from any quarter, this edition is, is sent forth without change, humbly, commitly to the blessings of the God of truth. He goes in and talks about Judaism and baptism, and they try to say the sprinkling of blood was baptism. It wasn't. The Jews practiced dipping. All right, that's the book, Baptizo. I read a little bit from it. I, I've read the whole thing. Now, let's go back where we were. We covered that just a little bit. And the sprinkling of water upon people for baptism is an abscess imitation. In the last class I said sprinkling is not baptism. Pouring is not baptism. It has not baptism nor those using it have authority to baptize. Period. It says here uh, the word Anabaptist. The word Anabaptist means baptized Christians. Which which understood in those days mean an immersed believer. Now they've been persecuted in every way for their views down through for the last 2,000 years basically. These persecutors would say as much of the Anabaptists and rather the baptized Christians of this nation. Further remarks, persecutors are maliciously mistaken and show their ignorance in calling them Anabaptists. For the practice of baptism according to scripture that, grie that grieves you it seems but you have learnt a new way, both in the matter and the in the manner. Babies instead of believers, for manner, sprinkling at a font instead of baptizing in water. You are loath to go with your long gowns. You have found a better way than was ever prescribed by our Lord Jesus Christ. You are ignoramuses. 
Now let's go on. They talked about the silliness of infant baptism. It doesn't do the infant any good, and all it does is give them a false promise that the original sin was forgiven. It is not. Baptism doesn't forgive sins at all. It is a practice. It's something that you can do because you have been forgiven, and only believers have been forgiven. It goes on here through different ones, great debates on baptism, uh, the clothing, worn during baptism was a great debate also because they had gowns and such and such and sometimes people were baptized as close to the nude as they could be. They wanted water all over their bodies and not on their clothing. There was a man by the name of Clem or A. R. Ritter, was a prominent Baptist in London. He originally came from Worcester, was formerly a member of the Church of England. He became a Baptist about the year 1637. That's the years that the Baptists came to America, 1638, 1639. Dr. John Clark and, and uh, they founded two church, churches there in Rhode Island. He was a man of education, attended public meetings on several occasions, drew up positions uh, to parliament, parliament and transacted other business. Edwards abused him on all occasions, even uh, pronounced him as an atheist. Baptism, Baptists didn't believe in infant baptism, so they called us atheist. Baptism did, or Baptists didn't practice uh, uh, legal marriages, so they called us uh, illegitimate children. They called him a wolf, apostates, subtle man, corrupting and bending his errors. And if you look up here again, the, for, the formula for witches and warlocks, witches were women inspired to commit heresy. A witch means women inspired to commit heresy. Baptists were persecuted as witches. He wrote a book called The Vanity of Childish Baptism. It's probably one of the most scholarly works written on the baptismal con controversy in 1641. Now, Baptist, it says here, the Baptists of the middle part of the 17th century, that's the 16 countries were controversialist. They wanted to get up and speak about what the Bible teaches compared to what the people taught, their rigoro, their doctrines, their dogma. The Baptists in the middle part of the 17th century were controversialists. They were all compelled to debate, to defend their ways. Now let me tell you a little something. Baptists debating with other religions went on until the 1900s and the last debate we have on our websites by Dr. Chastain was about 1996 or 97, something like that, maybe 1998. It's up there with the Church of Christ. I put on Dr. Chastain's um, side of the debate only because the other one was just foolishness. They have no foundation. But I put that up there because he was a great speaker, a great debater on the American side, but that time in history has pretty much come and gone. I just preach the truth. And I want to say this also. I want to tell some of you out there that don't believe what I'm teaching. I'm not trying to do this to insult you, intimidate you in any way. I'm doing this to teach the word, what the Word of God teaches and why Baptists or teaching what they teach today. Many Baptists today in our modern age do not believe what I'm telling you. They want great big churches, they want no controversy, they, they, they won't speak out against the charismatic movement, they won't speak out against Catholicism. Anybody that wants to come to their churches and put money in the, in the till, they will accept. They got big numbers. When you start drawing lines of demarcation what truth is and what error is, 
then people start going away. The truth, the people in the truth will always say, but it's sometimes not in the majority. It said various methods of debating were were adopted for removing this general dislike and answering the wicked accusations made against them. They issued pamphlets in defense of their opinions, and many books were written because of this. We just read a book by the Pedo Baptists, by the Presbyterians, actually defending their side of sprinkling for baptism. There is no defense to it. Yet they wrote a multi-page book there, defending their, and trying to go back and, and prove sprinkling in the, in the days of the Judaism and all that, the sprinkling of blood. Baptism was baptism always. They baptized the sheep before they sacrificed them. Bat Jerusalem was surrounded by baptismal fonts all over the place. They subscribed to numerous confessions of faith. They were ready to, in season and out of season, to meet their opponents. They challenged them public disputation now in London and in, in, the, in the country. Ordinary buildings proved to be too small and inconvenient for the excitement and eager crowds attended these disputations. And the largest accommodation being afforded by the parish church to the parish church, they commonly hurried. The occasion of these discussions was often the fierce opposition of by the local con cl clergymen. But with sometimes an uneasy consciousness on the subject of baptism, some members of the congregation, the victory, as in all subject public discussions, was usually claimed by both sides. Dr. Benjamin Marcus Bogard, Dr. Hoyt Chastain. These were two of the greatest debaters in what we might call landmark Baptist or landmark Southern Baptist. Uh, they don't, many landmarkers or missionary Baptists don't like to be aligned with Southern Baptists at all, but they all were one people at one time. Period. That's church history. That's it. No, no discussion after that is facts. Most of the churches, like in, and I, I'll get to that, the church out there in, in uh, Chapter, California. We're going to go to the Baptists in California from this book. And I knew many of these men myself. I'm old enough to know that. One of the men that founded more churches in California than anybody else, as far as I know, was Dr. Was Dud Pointer. And Dud Pointer introduced me to the presbytery when I was ordained. He, you can listen to that on the sermon audio also or the other in my ordination service. You'll hear him introducing me and he is the main subject of many of the churches in California. We'll get to that later. Now, Dr. Benjamin Bogart and Hoyt Chastain did more debating than anyone that I know of at times in early America from the 1800s to to the late 1900s. Ben Bogard died in the middle 1950s, so he didn't debate this side. But I've got a whole books of written debates. Now I'm going to read one of them. I probably will read one between Benjamin Marcus Bogard and Amy McPherson. That one ought to be exciting, huh? I'm going to read that one. And you'll understand what they debated about. The debating. Debating. Now, Dr. Hoyt Chastain, in his last debate, he talked about, he said, people don't like debates today and they don't think nobody wins or whatever, but some people were confirmed in the truth. They're all there, they're going to be rooting for one guy in one side of the debate and the other ones are going to be rooting for the other guys and both of them think they won. But in all reality, sometimes, some of those on the opposing side became adherence to the truth. <clears throat> they were ready in and out of season. They went mostly to the opponent's churches because they didn't have churches big enough to do anything. The opponents had great big churches because they were church and state. They were supported by the church state. The report of these debates was usually published by the opponents of the Baptists. 
not the vacuum. There was large room for partiality and fairness. These one-sided accounts were published often with marginal commentary and one at least published in a scandalous front piece which depicted 15 different sorts of Anabaptists. The first of these debates occurred in 1641 between Dr. Featley and, the, uh, and four particular Baptists. It was somewhere in South Work, probably in the parish church. Sir John Linthal was present. Now we're talking about debates among religion in this message. With many knights and ladies and gentlemen. There were also present some of the illiterate sort. Upon them Dr. Featley looked with disdain. The discussion was held in the year of Charles I had broken with Parliament and two months before it began the royal standard was unfurled at Nottingham and a week later it was it had closed Charles fought his last battle. The disputants were hardly fairly matched. Dr. Featley was a veteran debater and had won many encounters with the Jesuits. His intimate friend and said the Catholics condemned him for that he was of low of stature, yet admired him for his ready answers and shrewd distinctions. Yet this friend of 37 years found him meek and gracious and affable and merciful. This would not be suspected from the reading this debate. In European seminaries he was regarded as a sagious and ardent doctor. His opponents were four Baptists. One of them was described as a Scotchman. Another was called Cuffin. This was uh, none other than William Kiffin. For two years past, the pastor of Devonshire Baptist Church, he was not, on, not only 30 years, six years of age, and yet had before him 59 years of pastoral checkered life. Of the other two disputants were in no information. There is no information about them. The version of the debate is given to Featley as a long, drawn-out, rambling discussion on baptism. Featley was insulting but not convincing. At the conclusion, says Featley, it grew late and the conference broke off. The issue of the conference was, first, that the knights and ladies and gentlemen gave the doctor great thanks, and secondly, three of the Anabaptists went away discontented. The fourth seemed in part satisfied and desired a second meeting with the opponent. But the next day conferred with the rest of the sect, and he altered his resolution, and neither he nor any of the other sect ever since that day troubled the doctor or any other minister in length with the second debate. Featley's version of the debate was published two years, two and a half years later, and debate under the title of Dippers Dipped. Now these debates went on for many years. The Baptists debated, this is a this is a debate right here. This is a debate on their part. Now I'm gonna walk over here, hopefully I'll get out of the camera for a moment. But around here in different places I have many, many, many debates. Let's see if I can find them. here in the behind and I hope that I can find what I want to find. Get back up here, and I'll just show you, show to you some to you some of this, some of the books. The Life and Works of Benjamin Marcus Bogart. I wish that they had done this with a uh, Boy Chastain. 
it shows many of the pictures in here. Let's see if I can find out. Okay, that's not the one I want. I've read these in depth. Okay, this is a... I'm going to read to you some of the titles here. Why did Bogard debate? Early debates. The bogard Borden debate. At Fordswell, Mississippi, bogard Warlick debate, published. bogard Chisholm debate. The bogard clark debate in Thalia, Texas. The Methodists go down in defeat at Belmont, Mississippi. Elder Austin's report. Bogard's arrest. He was arrested. Another debate with the Campbellites, that's the Church of Christ. The Bogart Austin debate, the McPherson debate. All right, that's on page 103. Let's see here what it says. One hundred and three. Now this is a long debate. February the 5th to the 9th, 1934. Mm. William M. Thompson Campbellite at Haskell, Oklahoma, enjoyed a great victory. May the 22nd, engaged in debate with the famous, or rather notorious, Amy McPherson. Amy Simple McPherson, founder of the Four Square Gospel Church and headquarters of Los Angeles, California. The debate was enlarged the tabernacle in North Little Rock, Arkansas, May the 22nd, with, with about 6,000 attending. Now I'm reading this to you so you'll just know what happened in these days. And the whole thing about this with the Bogart McPherson debate, the Foursquare Church, Calvary Chapel, all of this is from this Mavis McPherson. This is the founder. It was a charismatic movement. She was doing healings and all kinds of things down in the Angelus Temple down in Southern California. And, uh, of course, there was a lot of controversy on what happened to her for a period of time. But she would, uh, they had great song services. They gave a lot of money. She built a lot of things. She had palaces, etc. But Bogard debated on her, debated with her on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased with the completion of the Bible. And she basically just said, look at me, I'm doing them. That's what the story was. 6,000 attending subject affirmed that divine healing and miracles as taught and manifest in the Bible ended with the apostolic age. The debate was an easy victory for me. It was taken in shorthand and published in a book and made three speeches, Bogart's personal journal. The debate was one of Bogart's most spectacular. She was a holy roller, Pentecostal, apostolic brand of religion. This woman, Amy Deer, was an evangelist among this group. She had led in establishing the Mamelis Angeles Temple in Los Angeles, California. Miss McPherson came to North Little Rock, Arkansas for an evangelistic campaign in 19, May 1934. A large tabernacle was constructed of wood. There was an account of it in his words. The debate came as a result of a challenge given to me by Mrs. Amy Simple McPherson during her tabernacle meetings in North Little Rock, Arkansas. She challenged Ben Bogard. Ben Bogard was a genius. He was a man of great education. He was an educator, and he was a preacher. And he preached, he was in, even in, uh, uh, oh, I can't think of the man right now that had all of these, all of these things, things that nobody would believe it or not. Ripley's, believe it or not. He was Ripley's, believe it or not, because he had preached every Sunday for 60-something years. She had attracted a great deal of attention, and many were being led astray by her false teachings. I preached against her doctrine both over the radio and in my pulpit in the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church where I am pastor. The newspapers quoted extracts from my sermons, and McPherson listened in over the radio, and she challenged me to come over to her tabernacle and debate with her. Now, over there would be in the enemy ground, basically. 
In other words, all of the people in her tabernacle would be for her. And all these would be lambasting her opponent. She said, before several thousand people, I heard her say over the radio that if this preacher does not believe what I preach, let him bring his Bible, come over here, and I will debate it with him. A day or two later, after I attended her services, and in substance, she said, I understand that the preacher who said my work is of the devil is in the congregation. Of course, you know how many booze went out for that. If he will prove by the Bible that miracles such as Jesus and the apostles wrought are no longer possible, I will close my Bible and never preach again. What a statement, huh? The people understood that she had challenged for a debate, and I wrote her a courteous letter as follows. Little Rock, Arkansas, May the 8th, 1934. Miss Amy Simple McPherson, North Little Rock, Arkansas. Dear Miss McPherson, in reference to my broadcast last Sunday, you seemed to challenge me or anyone else to meet you in debate and our differences. I might have understood you, I might have misunderstood you, but I listened to at your service over the radio, and I seemed to me that you challenge anyone to meet you in debate. If I am mistaken, I beg your pardon. Being a gentleman, I would not think of disturbing your services. I believe in free speech and free press and free religion and free radio. I would not stop you or anyone else. I hate intolerance and love freedom of worship and freedom of speech. I believe we should discuss frankly and honestly our differences and not persecute anyone because he or may not agree with us. I have somewhat of a reputation as a debater, and debaters are always, uh, always tolerant, and for that reason I tolerate what I do not endorse. And try to show those who do not agree with me their error. I am willing to make that effort with you. I'm willing to make that effort with you. Now this is history here. You said in your broadcast that you did not believe in using the scissors on the Bible and that you thought that all of it applies to us in this age. For that reason, you take the Bible from cover to cover as your rule of faith and practice. Will you affirm that? They don't. The entire Bible, the Bible from cover to cover, is the rule of faith and practice to be observed in this age. If you will so affirm, I shall gladly deny it, and you can name the time and place for this discussion. Of course, the debate should be governed by the rules of honorable controversy, and have the time divided equally between us, and I wait for your answer. Sincerely, Ben M. Bogart. Ms. McPherson gave the forego foregoing letter to her representative, and he came to my office with a letter, and since I wrote the letter to her personally, this gentleman could not have had it unless she turned it over to him. He asked me if I, would, if I wrote the letter, and I told him I did, and he said to me that Ms. McPherson asked him to come to me and negotiate the terms of the debate. He said that he would call me over the phone at about 5 o'clock and tell me the results of his conference with Miss McPherson. He did not call and I therefore addressed another letter to Miss McPherson as follows. Little Rock, Arkansas, May 11, 1934. Dear Miss McPherson, I have so far received no reply to my letter which I accepted your challenge to debate. Your representative came and brought the letter and I wrote to you and thus you have answered through your representative. But he did not call me over the phone, as he said he might do. And thus I am left not knowing whether you are willing to face an opponent to open discussion or not. I attended your services last night, and you took particular pains to tell the audience of my presence. He was there. I know of other people went there. Marilyn, your father, went to one of her meetings. Yes. I was made to hope that you would stand by your challenge and because you said and were correctly quoted in this morning's paper as saying, if this man referring to me or anyone else proved by the Bible that the day of miracles has ended, I will quit and never preach again. That is exactly what I affirm and what I will affirm. 
Since you have this repeated, your challenges have submitted the very words I shall be glad to use in my affirmation. You will please name the time and the place for the debate, and we shall have it. You will either do this, or I shall read this letter over the radio next Sunday and release them to the newspapers with no doubt will like the story of this sort. I assure you that the wisecracks and stunt performances will not long deceive the masses. Thinking people will ask you why you did not debate when you have made the challenge and it has been accepted, I await patiently your answer. Please have your representative phone me or call me and we may arrange the details. I am only accepting your challenge. You have been posing as an ordained Baptist preacher. You are not an ordained Baptist preacher and never have been. The church that ordained you ceased to be a Baptist church and became a Pentecostal church before it ordained you. I am perfectly familiar with your record and I have spent much time on the Pacific Coast and have visited Angelus Temple. I was there while you were in the hospital under a good doctor and two nurses and I spoke over the radio from the church at Open Door and exposed your heresies right there in Los Angeles. The Church of the Open Door. That's the one that Dr. Gene Scott later bought. Mm -hmm. I have wondered why you use a doctor and medicine and surgery when you get ill and yet ask others to discard all of these and expect the Lord to work a miracle to cure them. I am not guessing at what I'm doing. Sincerely, Gwen M. Bogard. This letter frightened her and she declined the debate. So her representative told me, unless I would promise not to expose her record, since I had told her that I knew her record and was on the coast while she was making some of the worst of it. But of it, I made the promise to let her record alone and confine myself strictly to the subject, leaving all personalities out. Now, Church of Christ and everything, they go after, if you, if you listen to the debate in all, in every way, you'll find the Church of Christ going after Hoyt Chastain's character, not the Bible. His character, not the Bible. Bogart never said anything about the man's character. He just proposed what the Bible said. Leaving all personalities out, to this she finally agreed, and the following was agreed upon as the subject of the debate. Resolved that the miracles of divine healing as manifested in the Bible ended with the apostolic age. <coughs> we met at the appointment time, and she and her crowd of several thousand admirers were well organized. They had been listening to her for 21 days and were under her hypnotic control almost perfectly. They sought to hoot and howl and boo and catcall in such a manner as to drive me from the platform. This is what happens then. When you don't want to hear the truth, you scream and squalor and close your ears like they did when they were going to stone Stephen. They close their ears stopped up their ears and began to chew on him with their teeth. Mm -hmm. But they failed in this and debate was taken in spite of all effort to break it up by such disorder. She couldn't meet him. She had no foundation. So what would you do to try to destroy the debate? I had chosen Elder Dan Jackson from Texas, Arkana as my moderator and he tried to preside but the unruly mob of McPhersonites made it impossible for him to keep order and he had a difficult time in protecting me so that I might speak my full time as the effort was to keep me from using my a lot of time. They didn't want to allow his words to be heard. Such disgraceful conduct on the part of the McPhersonites showed that they were regarded as a religion. What they regarded as religion. I was prepared for a lot of disorder, but I was not prepared for the vicious mob spirit that was plainly manifested by Mrs. McPherson's followers. They seemed to think that noise, confusion, cat calls, and booing and insulting remarks shot at me from the audience was to 
correct thing to do, and they made the most of it. The reader may ask why I did not withdraw from such a mob and refuse to debate under such conditions. That was exactly what they were seeking to do. They didn't want to debate. They did not want to debate. If they had driven me from off the platform, they would have shouted victory and would have really thought that was such as that was a victory. My purpose was to expose the heresy and not to win such individuals as were under the hypnotic power of Miss McPherson. I was making a book that would be read by thousands after the mob had silenced. Besides, I am not better than, than Paul who faced fanatical mobs and was eventually treated and even mobbed by his opposers. Police protection saved me from violence. When you don't have the truth, you become violent. Catholicism, Islam, violence, violence, violence. Error is always violent. And the stenographer got what was said, and the debate is before you. You may read it and decide if it is worthwhile to face a howling mob in order to get both sides before the public. Miss. McPherson is the founder of a new denomination known as the Foursquare Gospel Church. Over 300 congregations of this new denomination have been organized and she is recognized as the head of it. Besides being the founder of this new religious cult, she is the most she is the best representative of all the shades of the of that heresy have in the United States and possibly in the world. This is a very powerful woman. The people called Holy Rollers, Pentecostals, Come Outers, and such alike all teach substantially the same thing as Miss McPherson teaches, and when she is met successfully, all of them are met successfully. This debate becomes especially interesting and helpful when it is considered that I have not only met the four square gospel heresy, but at the same time have met all classes of Holy Rollers and Pentecostals and Apostolics and such like are spreading themselves over all the land. Holy Rollerism, Pentecostalism, McPhersonism are substantially the same different thing in small details. Modern miracles, divine healing, and speaking in tongues and such are all exposed in this debate and the beauty of it that is the best representative they have had presented on their side. The debate therefore becomes authority on the subject and it can be used successfully in combating the errors and connected with the heresy all over the land. The evil effects of it came from all type of religion, shows itself in loose sexual relationships, all classes of them have very large percent of sexual immorality among them, they marry and divorce their husbands and wives, they are living in an atmosphere of emotionalism, it results in disastrously in sex relationship. There is a universal and exceedingly large percent of sex promiscuity among their young people as they follow example of the older ones. A visit to the Arkansas Training School for Girls confirmed this discussion for the superintendent, a very high class lady, told me that 80% of the fallen girls consigned to her care came from the homes of Pentecostals and other so-called holy rollers. The notorious scandals connected with McPhersonism are so well known that it is needless to recount them here. No doubt that was the reason Mrs. McPherson demanded that I do not go into her, her record before she would agree to debate. Bob Schuler, the famous Methodist preacher in Los Angeles, has exposed McPhersonism in a book entitled McPhersonism. If what he says in the book is not true, he could be sent to the penitentiary for criminal libel. But McPherson has wisely chosen to not prosecute him. That book can be obtained from Bob Schuler, pastor of Trinity Methodist Baptist Church, Los Angeles, California for 25 cents. Of course, this is a long time ago. And those who want to know the terrible story can order the book. If this notice can be the cause of thousands ordering the book, I shall be glad. Vicious sex relationships are written all over these modern miracle sex and the terrible record of the Arkansas State Training School for Girls as related to me by the superintendent shows the need for exposures such as this in this debate. 
<coughs> the pretense of healing is fully exposed in the debate, and the appendix which follows the record of the debate gives startling facts that need to be published all over the world. They, false, they falsely, when they make such big claims, and if they actually did perform the miracles, it would not be that by the power of the de power, it would be by the power of the devil and not of God. Every true preacher in the Word of God should help in spreading the exposure as found in this debate. It should be part of the business of all good men to have to expose heresy, and especially such dangerous heresy as McPhersonism. And this is the four square gospel churches today. Holy Rollerism, Pentecostalism, such a life. Sincerely and earnestly, Benjamin Marcus Bogard, from the Bogard Mission Debate, published in 1934. Bogard years later reminisced. Amy was a a productionist, a show-off, a Hollywood stuff. She wore a long, flowing white robe. When she raised her arms, she had an angelic appearance, apparitions underneath big walls like angels' wings. People fell for the showmanship. They were hypnotized by her appearances and her gestures. When we were ready to go to the platform, Amy suggested we walk down the aisle together, arm in arm, to show the people we were friends. I told her to go on and I would be there directly. Shucks, I was, wasn't going to have my picture taken while walking arm in arm with a woman like her. No telling what she would make of it. The people almost got out of hand. It looked as if fighting would break out over at once or twice. Some of the young men broke soda bottles so they could use them, the neck as a handle and grip and jagged edge to strike with just in case. The PA system seemed to go off while I was speaking. Anyone she left, anyway, she left town and the lumber yard was left with all the bill for the lumber of the tabernacle. Didn't pay her bill. Back to the Foursquare Gospel Movement was broken. Thirty-two years later, the movement has not amounted to much in Little Rock, Arkansas, but it has all over the world. Died 31st to the August the 3rd, James Sermon, Holiness at Lost Hill, uh, Lost Hill uh, Schoolhouse community near Desmond's, Arkansas, Death Ark, Arkansas. He had made 16 speeches and won a great victory. In the fall of 1931, the Baptist the Baptist Bible School was started at Antioch Church. This took a great deal of Bogart's time and he held no debates in 1935. These are debates. That's what I'm talking about. This is how they were held. Most of the time, they were held in the enemy's ground. They were not held on neutral ground. You see that if you see the debate, the Church of Christ uh, debate with Hoyt Chastain and his appointment, or opponent, you'll see some of that. They were very quiet at that time. They took all their catcalling everything afterwards. But you'll see that his side of the debate was very well prepared. He told me that that was the greatest debate that he ever did, and it was going to be the last one. He lived to be almost 100 years old. And it tells you when he died and everything on that debate. I hope you'll watch those debates. I think there are eight of them. I hope that you enjoyed this. And we're talking about debates tonight. And I hope that you understand and will go back and look at some of these debates. Sometimes debates do a lot of good. A lot of people today don't want to debate, and I don't really want to debate with anybody. I just present my case like I would in a debate, and, and that's it. If you believe it, you believe it. If you don't, you don't. I do it for the glory of God. Our Father, we send this message out for your honor and glory. Please use it wherever it goes. Touch people's hearts with it. Make them think. Make them consider their statue in life and who they are, who you are, and how to come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ and Him only. Not through emotion, not through rope, not through rigmarole, not through dogmas but in a real relationship between you and Him. Father, please forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name I pray.